friends and neighbors. We're going to go ahead and begin. And uh, thank you so much for coming for the forum this morning. Uh, it's my pleasure and joy to introduce to you uh, Jason Bergman. Jason is the executive director for Operation Bootstrap, headquartered in Minneapolis area of Minnesota. Uh, J the organization Operation Bootstrap Africa, we know it, perhaps you'll see it in the newsletters as OBA, is the organization that uh, channels our funding through for Maasai Girls School. So I wear my Maasai shirt today. And we also have, the, of course, in December, we do the collection for uniforms for girls at Maasai Girls School. So we moved it in here, and there's, if you want to, you know, pick up the little girls, probably some of you already have several of them at home. So, but uh, most important is the envelope to uh, be able to uh, pay for a uniform for the girls uh, at, um, at Maasai Girls School, the new ones coming in. And there, I think there are 65 in the new class, so that's what we always aim at, is to get uh, 65 uh, donations with that. So that's there, but we'll move it back out there as soon as we're done, um, so that you can, it'll be there throughout the whole month of December. So even if it's after Christmas, folks, if you got anything left over, uh, you can still go ahead and uh, uh, pay for our uniform. Uh, we're not partial as to when the time comes. Um, but it's really a, a joy. We, uh, every time we're back in Minnesota, for me to see relatives, Jason's become one of my cousins, because I think we always, we always see him as well. So we're really glad to have you here, and uh, we turn it to you, and uh, there'll be times for questions, etc. so if you run into something you want to ask, yeah, you know, let someone know, and um, we'll, get it, uh, we'll get an answer. Jason, welcome. He'll also be doing an announcement uh, later in the worship service. One, Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, cousin, friend, mentor, um, <laughs> something even greater than all of that. Thank you very much. And Marvin. Um, they say that you have 15 seconds to get someone's attention before they make a judgment whether or not they're going to listen to your presentation. <laughs> I've already used my 15 seconds. So. <laughs> So it was January 2020, just before COVID. Uh, the Maasai Girls School celebrated their 25th anniversary. It was a big deal. It was, it was wonderful. Gene and Mark were there, and maybe some, some, a few others. I don't remember who, we had a pretty good contingency of people there. We also had all of the hierarchy in the church, and we had the third president of Tanzania and his wife there, and all that, com that comes with. So that would be similar to having a Clinton or a Bush come to a high school to celebrate an anniversary. And so it was a very big deal. Well, after hours of ceremony, and if you've been there, you know how important ceremony is to the Tanzanians. They had, um, we're going to break for our tea and, and then probably do more. I'm not quite sure. And I was supposed to go up to the administrative building and glad hand with all the politicians. But I saw this group of women. They were dressed in black and they adorned themselves with the Maasai jewelry. So I knew that they were in the first couple classes of the Maasai Girls School. So I went over there and I introduced myself and, and then I asked them, what are you doing now? Who are you and what are you doing now? And they went around the circle and one was a pilot and there was an architect and there was a social worker and there was a lawyer and I said a doctor. And, and a graphic designer, and then there's one woman who was kind of bashful, she was kind of hiding behind. So naturally I made her more uncomfortable, I had her come to the front and tell me what she's, what she's been up to. And she introduced herself and she said, I'm a pastoralist. And I said, this is nothing to be ashamed of. All these other great achievers, we couldn't have dreamed that the school was going to produce doctors and lawyers and pilots and architects. The school was to give girls a chance to postpone marriage and to postpone childbirth, let their bodies grow up, let them learn a little bit about themselves and about the world around them, and then they can go back to the village. Well, I tried to make her feel better, but I don't think she really bought it. She was standing amongst all her, her classmates. Well, we, after the ceremony, the next day I dropped my group off at the airport. I had to continue on to Kenya. We had to visit a school way out in the bush by Lake Victoria. I went four days without electricity, running water, squatter toilets. You can just about imagine 
what I was like when I came back again. Dragging my bags through the airport, I heard the director, director. Nobody knows me here. So I just kept walking and finally it got louder and I turned around and it was her. It was the pastoralist. And we had big hugs and, and we were talking until I realized where we were and I said, what the hell are you doing at the airport? She goes, oh, I've been asked to speak at Oxford University in London. <laughs> Of course you are. <laughs> so when, we, when I came into OBA five years ago, I tried to look through the history and the files and I had all these stories, but we weren't really good about recording data, at least not what I could find. And so we've been collecting stories. And one of the and and, and the stories are just the stories are what I want you guys to to understand. We have been, for nearly 30 years, bringing these skinny little bush kids into the school. And when I say skinny, they're malnourished, they're, they're naive to the world, to the point where if you ask the, you know, the kids when they first come in to turn the lights off, they'll look up at the ball and go, <laughs> They are naive to the world. They are Maasai bush kids. And then when by the time they graduate, they are proud, powerful Maasai women. And so, I'm here for a couple of reasons. One, to say thank you. You guys have walked through, walked with these girls for decades. And that's something to be proud of. You have changed their lives in ways that we as Americans cannot understand. And I know you guys have had a lot of stories, but maybe I'll be able to to share just a few that you haven't, haven't heard. And, and then to talk about how they are changing their culture. Because if you and I went to Tanzania and said, you know, that is wrong, child marriage is wrong, just calling it marriage, in my opinion, is wrong. I think it's insulting to the dignity of the institution of marriage. They're selling young girls. And, they're, and they're, they're selling them for cows, and they're selling them for prestige. And, they're, and the girls are not necessarily getting pregnant. I mean, it's not consensual. I mean, if you're 12 years old, what's consensual about that? And so I struggle with this idea of calling it marriage and getting pregnant. You know, we're adults. We know what's going on. We don't have to. So not only are you giving these girls an education, and an education which, in the case of this pastoralist, she was speaking at Oxford University, but she was being globally recognized for her work with the women of the bush in, in Los Island. So they are changing their culture. You and I can go there and say child marriage or female genital mutilation is awful, sinful. Yes, it is. But we're not going to have an influence on their culture. It's the women, it's the girls that are demanding that change. And it's the poor boys that are just sitting there scratching their heads like, what do we do with this? <laughs> Who is this? What, how do I, how do I, she, she doesn't act like it. I have another story. So I was, uh, let's see, it was just before COVID again, so right about that 2000 mark. Um, the bishop, Bishop Masanova, had asked that if OBA is going to invest in education, that perhaps we could build a school out in South Maasai. So this is eight hours down a washboard road, and we drove it at about 100 miles an hour. And, and we got there, and we pulled up to the land that they are proposing the school goes to. And all of a sudden, a couple of motorcycles with three Maasai warriors on there carrying spears and machetes on their hips and all of a sudden a pickup with about six of them in the back of the truck and they slam on the brakes and the dust and this is the first time, I, my first time in, in Africa was in 2000 and this is the first time I was nervous. I thought, uh oh, what's going on here? Nothing makes sense, we're so remote, I'm just, they're, they're going to send me home in a bag. But it wasn't threatening. In fact, it was quite the opposite, because we had the bishop with us. And the bishop holds such great esteem in their culture that they were 
in a hurry to get there to welcome the bishop. And so, <laughs> so then, so everything was fine. We looked at the land, and it looked like it was very promising. And then, of course, we went to the church, and it was just you know mud and stick church, and it was packed because the bishop came to the village, and we were far. We were, we were very remote. And they had lots of dance and music and singing. It was fantastic. It was beautiful. And then it was time for speeches, of course. And as you know, you know the, the order of the speeches, the most important person goes last. And so we had the, the elders and the chief of the village, and we had the pastor. And, and then uh, I figured it was pretty close to my time, so I'm looking through some notes, you know, just kind of thinking of stuff. I don't know why, because they know zero English, but. I was preparing, and then all of a sudden the bishop puts his hand on, on mine and says, no, I'm going to go next. So, oh, okay, I get the day off, because <laughs> he's obviously the most important, right? So all of a sudden he, he gets up and he talks to him, and it was translated, it was whispered in my ear, and he was talking about, don't be afraid of educating your daughters, and that this is very important, and that this is the way of the future. And he was very encouraging, he said, you know, the, you know this, is, this is something that we need to do to make ourselves better. And then they asked me to speak. And I'm, whoa, all right, well, okay, I'll get back to my notes. And I kind of, you know, tried to say something um, that would be meaningful to, to the people in this village. It was translated. But then they forgot about Nashiva. Nashiva is a graduate of the Maasai Girls School. She's an architect. And they forgot about her. And so now, as an error of protocol, we have this woman speaking after the bishop, after the Mazungu, she was the last one to speak. She wasn't prepared, she didn't think this was gonna happen. So she went up and she said, you know, she greeted them, she said, I'm the Shira, I was, I'm a graduate of the Maasai Girls School. This village had two girls at the Maasai Girls School, so they were aware of that. She said, I then went to university and now I'm an architect. And they, you know, okay, fine. And then she said, but I am still a Maasai woman. And that brought down the place. I, thought, I literally thought the church was going to crack. It's going to fall down on us. That is how these, this is how the change is happening. And these Maasai girls and women are culturally smart. We have stories about how when a girl goes home, she brings a little bit of sugar. And now her father says, my daughter goes to the Maasai girls school and now I have sugar for my tea. These girls are smart because they, one of the first things they do when they get a job is they build a new home for their father and they put a steel roof on it. That, my daughter, went to the Maasai Girls School and look what she has done for me. It is changing. Every time I go there, um, I'll be driving through the streets of Arusha and all of a sudden, you know, probably a late 30, 40 year old woman will stop our vehicle and come up to us and say thank you. She was a graduate of Maasai Girl School. I am now an accountant. I am now this. I'm now that. They are proud, powerful women changing their culture in ways that we can't, right? We have, um, we've been collecting stories, and I don't have enough for all of you, and that's a great thing because there's more people than what I prepared for, right? Um, but I will pass these around. And these, this is just one story of a graduate who has, who has come full circle and is now affecting her culture in a, in a positive way. We had asked Julie Cutler, she's the author of a book called Among the Maasai, and some of you may have read her book. And she had, uh, we asked her to go back to Tanzania and to gather stories. Because again, we were struggling with data. You know, we can count how many how many students graduated, but we don't know how many graduated from university. We just kind of lost contact. But now everyone has cell phones. Everybody has cell phones, <clears throat> so it's much easier to connect. We were hoping that Julie would make twelve interviews, but she had thirty, and it's not just of graduates. But it was out of those thirty, there were. Uh, um, husbands and parents and so we get to hear their perspective of this counter-cultural girl going you know leaving the house and changing the patterns and changing their culture and so we're going to be creating a, a coffee table book 
And this is, we're going to be celebrating, we're going to release this book at our 60th anniversary in 25. So about, you know, almost a year now. It'll be a year and a half because I think we're going to do it in September. So about a year and a half, we'll have this coffee table book. And it'll be all these stories. But one of the things that we learned, and as I mentioned, we have, <coughs> we have powerful women in powerful positions, of doctors, of lawyers, of different, different degrees in their society. But we also learned that this coming election, two of our graduates is running for par are running for parliament. That is, that's the paradigm change. It's happening. When Jean and Marv were there, you know, 20 years ago, and working with these skinny little bush kids, there's no way you could have predicted the impact that had. And there's no way you guys could have years ago said, yeah, I'll, I'll sponsor a kid. I don't know what this means, but I'll, I'll, I'll do it. Gene and Marv says this is a good thing, so I'll, I'll do it. No way did you know then of the impact that is making. And again, it's not just in Maasai land. It's throughout Tanzania. And for everybody who was touched by the presentation by the pastoralist being globally recognized for her work with the Maasai women in at Oxford University in London. It is working. It is doing. It just takes a while. We talk about planting seeds. And, and I, I love coming to Seattle. I love this, this area of the world. And every time I come, I love it more. And even though it's raining now, I haven't been here at this time of year, and it's, it's, it's beautiful. I was up by uh, Billingham uh, yesterday, I think. And, you know, and so I came and I took the scenic route back and I met with some people in Bow and I just kind of, I just, it's, it's amazing, first of all, that all these people want to help, right? It's just, it's glorious. I was at a coffee shop downtown um, Bellevue and, you know, the, the place was packed and there's all these people and they know they're high income people and all this potential, but I had this retired teacher sitting with me and she is so turned on. She had, she had spent some time volunteering in Arusha and she was so turned on. And we look at, you know, all of what's going on. It's just exciting to see. You know, I mean, our lives are busy, right? We can't spend all of our time thinking about everybody else. But those that do, I think, I think there's a parallel in the Gospels. I always think about doubting Thomas, who needed to put his finger in the hand and his finger in the side. He said, you know, blessed are those that believe without putting their finger in the side of Christ. Blessed are those who, who believe that empowering women in Tanzania will make a difference, even though you may not have been there. Or if you have been there, even after a decade, how much of the culture would you say you understand? You know, there's so many nuances. And so, and then the impact of having these girls. So a couple of weeks ago, I was in the bush of uh, Tanzania, of Maasai land, it was wonderful, up by Eloi and Manduli Ju. And so we were pretty far out there. And uh, we were welcomed into a boma, and it was the grass hut, and you know, cow manure walls, it was, it was fantastic. It was a bigger one. And so most of, all of my group fit in there, and some of the wives, and many of the kids. And so we were talking, and they were going through a very difficult drought. It's been multiple years. Um, in fact, the Masai Girls School was without water for a while. It was very, very challenging. And someone asked him, you know, the cows are so important to their culture. How many cows do you have? And he said, well, I used to have 50. Now I have two. And then someone else asked, how many children do you have? And he kind of looked at us. Well, it's bad luck to count your children. He knew exactly how many cows he has now and had. He knew what the drought did to his, to his, to his wealth, his cow wealth. Um, but he didn't know how many children he had. There's a lot of them. Gosh, and there's a whole range of them. Um, it, was, it was very interesting. And it was interesting for me because I have been following the Maasai for over 20 years. I have this much understanding of their culture. But I'm, I'm looking at this guy, and he, he did not even know Swahili. Couldn't speak Swahili. And so that tells us that he did not go, he did not even go to primary school. 
And so we had everything interpreted through our guides who were Maasai, and so we could understand what's going on. Um, and I was just, I was looking at him and his family situation and his cows. Now, why would he allow his daughter to go to school when he just lost, what, 90, 99% of his herd, 99% of his wealth? And I'm trying to figure this out. We're just kind of piecing this out. But the drought had affected them in such a way that he was, he, I don't think he was being altruistic, honestly. And really, we have to, we have to assume that the fathers and these people will make decisions that's best for them, right? I mean, most of us are, that's in our, in our human nature. But because he is so poor now, it's just one more mouth he doesn't have to feed. But he's also seen how these girls have brought wealth to him to the other fathers in different ways. And so it's, you know, what are the decisions that the fathers are making? Sometimes, <clears throat> it's just a couple years ago, the decision to go to school was not the father's decision. We had heard um, Dr. Msinjili, you guys, it's a, probably a name that you, you're very familiar, he was the headmaster at the Mossad Girls School for a decade. Um, a girl and a mother went from southern Tanzania, walked all the way up to northern Tanzania, showed up at the doorstep or at the gate of the Maasai Girls School, we heard that you educate girls. <laughs> and said, oh, Jason, I don't know what to do. <laughs> you know, it was, it was, the school was full. You know, does she have the academic with all to, to succeed in this school? But the choice was already made. They couldn't go back. For she had, by leaving, fleeing, she had embarrassed her father, incredibly. The mother will never be able to go back again because she would be beat. Um, the daughter would be beat for embarrassment. The family that was supposed to take her as a new daughter, or daughter-in-law, would beat her and never trust her. And she would be at a flight risk forever. And so she would never be respected. And then you think about the journey that these two had gone through. If this woman was willing to walk the length of the, from the south to north of Tanzania, it doesn't take a lot of creativity to think about what she did to ensure her daughter got an education. These are real, and these are happening today. But it is making a difference. And by, by the struggles of these kids, they are changing the culture. And that's what you guys have walked through. And so I have, um, well, hopefully you have, um, just a short video that will, in many ways, you know, it will speak our contemporary language. And it will put a face, and it will kind of put a context for us. While he's working on that, I'm going to just share some more insight. Um, so the girls come into the school pre-Form 1, especially with the Bush kids. It's very, very difficult because you know they, they oftentimes have never heard a lick of English, but yet all the classes are taught in English. And so we do this pre-Form 1 where they come in for a couple of months and they kind of get acculturated into a dormitory setting and into um, a, a, you know, a lifestyle food that is different. And they go through forms one, two, three, and four, and they take a national examination. And if they pass that, they can go on to forms five and six. Sorry about that. I went too long without, uh, and the whole system fell asleep. So after, after form four, they take a test, and that will determine if they go into form four and forms five, which would be like equivalent to uh, grades 12 and 13. And then they can qualify for a college at, um, in, and that's a three-year program. But there is a tenth. Yeah, I can take it from here. Thank you. Yeah. I gotta just finish my thought here, and then I'll, then I'll do the moves uh, video. And so, from form four examinations to when they can start form five is ten months. That's a ten-month gap in which these kids oftentimes go home. Maybe a third of them stay on campus because they know it's just not safe uh, for them to, to go home. 
but we lose. We went back and we checked our, our data for the last five years. Some years, it was as little as 30% of the kids to over 50% don't come back. And they don't come back because they, perhaps they went to another school, and that has happened occasionally, but they're getting pregnant, they're getting married. This is a very, very uh, dangerous or vulnerable time in the girl's life. And so what the school is, the headmaster is now uh, Tuli Siliani, and she has come with a, a 10 month um, preform five program. It'll be life skills. And so they'll be teaching tailoring and animal husbandry and um, food. And so it'll help them prepare, you know, with life skills. And so this is something that we're hoping to introduce, hopefully by January, so we can keep these kids on campus and we don't lose all these kids at such a vulnerable time. So we'll do this quick video and then we can, um, and then if you have questions, I would love to hear what you're thinking. When we talk about a woman's love in a Maasai context, you talk about, you know, the first one to wake up and the last one to sleep. If they don't go to school, they would get married at the age of 12 at the latest and have kids before they even hit 15. Everything about you and your life is dictated by someone else, and that's a man. My dad, he wanted me to get married. He had already a number of men lined up for me. It was a constant, a constant, constant struggle. Having that taste, actually, taste of education and being able to dream about the future I want gave me the reason and the will to actually fight. The world out there without education it's not something I would wish for any girl. And this is the point of this school to empower us so that we can empower the others. This is a school which was started with an intention of helping girls from what we call marginalized communities. These tribes have got a very strong conservative culture which will not accept girls' education. I remember this year, one woman came with a girl and told me, please, can you please recruit my daughter? I cannot go with this girl back home. It's not only that she'll be forced to a husband, but I'll also be terribly punished. And I said, oh my, how can I do that? A girl who wants to come to school and I turn her to be a house girl? No. My passion to help these girls is for them to be able to feel that they are free citizens of this country, that they have the right to choose what to do and what not to do, who they want to be and who they don't want to be. They have that right. They are normal human beings. Why can't they have the rights that men have? Maasai is a school where I grew. It's like a home to me. It's a place where you got to learn life. You got to learn how other people are living. You got to understand what you are for yourself. I really wish if my dreams come true, I will be able to help girls like myself. If you want to get a good society, educate a girl, because she's going to be a mother. She's going to be a guardian. She's going to be a good parent. What we are doing here, we are planting a seed which will germinate and it will never stop because these girls now are ambassadors. They become different people, they live differently, they think different, they do things differently and also they impact their societies. They define who they are and they are able to stand for what they want. Um, I'd like to just ask, do you guys have any questions? Yes, sir. Do you have a good website or things like that? Absolutely. Our website hopefully works better than this. <laughs> the website is uh, bootstrapafrica.org. And um, there'll be videos there. And uh, of course, you, know, you can contribute there as well. Talking about contributing, so uh, Jean put a pitch, uh, a pitch in for the uniforms. 
uniforms are great, right? We understand the necessity of it. But do you understand how how ne necessary they are at the Mossad Girls School? When we go recruiting, and in the last couple of years we've been recruiting further and further into the bush, and a lot of times we get acknowledged, we get information from teachers in the, in the primary schools and say, they'll call us and say, hey, come check this out. We have a couple of girls. They're vulnerable. They're going to get married like two days after school is out. Um, so come, come to our school and, and recruit here. And so we go all over around the bush, and oftentimes we'll have a car running for the last day of school, the last day of primary school. They'll jump in there and they'll come to school. They come with only the shirt on their back. So that we provide, you know, the uniforms, you know, toothbrush, you know, everything that a girl needs. And it is for, um, it's, it's, you know, for six years. And so, well, I went to seven years because of that 10 month gap. So when we talk about uniforms, you guys are going to be giving a uniform to that first year student. And that's absolutely necessary. But it's also, um, we need uniforms for, for the rest of the kids. We bring sweatshirts. Who, do we have any Mad Hatters in the room? <laughs> so there's a group of women who are knitting hats for the kids. Yeah. And yeah, it's, right here, come knit with Yeah, right there. That's, I can't tell you how, how valuable this is. They come in, 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 the, you know, in, in the summer, which is their winter, it's not quite this cold, but it's raining, and they're always freezing. They'll be, I'll be wearing a short sleeve shirt, and they'll be wearing you know, down jackets in the Rusha. Um, but that is a very big thing. That's, thank you. Thank you for doing that. Mark. May I ask a question to tell a story about yeah. Martha Legatoni? Absolutely. There. She would be in the first class, and in those days, they tried to get two girls, three two girls, to you know, come and go. And they got her and her cousin. And for four and four, they went home. They were both targeted, and they both got pregnant, intentionally and purposely. And you think that stopped us. We were not going to bring them back to our school, but we stuck them into Marengue. She coined the school next door. And she has gone on to become who she has become. It was just awesome. Right. Number two, they don't whiten their teeth. You don't eat sugar and all, eat all the bad stuff. Let the color our teeth. <laughs> That's right. That's right. right? The, the genetics, I mean, their teeth, I've got it. I had thousands, thousands of dollars worth of dental work to make my teeth straight. I mean, they just have beautiful, beautiful teeth. Do we have any other questions? We just have a couple of minutes. I was going to ask, and kind of like follow up to Marvin. You, the girls that do go home, I was just wondering if there's any follow up with them, how many of them ever do come Right. Um, like I said, so from between Form 4 and Form 5, we lose somewhere between 30 and 50%. I mean, it's just. And when you say they uh, forced to get pregnant, you know, or we're, we're all adults here, right? We heard, last year I heard a story where a father locked his daughter up in a house with a man she's never met before, or, you know, probably much, much older, for three days so that she'd get pregnant. So then if she's pregnant, she can't go to school, therefore we might as well get married. And then he can get his pride price and get his cows. It's happening. I mean, it's... It really is. So they, it, this is just so important. Um, and then when they get that, they get that chance. You know, we'll see uh, their scores. The first year, their form one, uh, they don't do it as well. They they don't know English very well. But man, once they start, it just skyrockets. They skyrockets. They grab onto this opportunity with both hands, and they just run with it because they know what they'll turn. Yes, sir. So, when the girls are out of class, do they generally speak English or do they revert back to their dialect? Or, right. and, and I would think it would help. I mean, if you're in an environment where all the other girls are speaking English, that would really help for them. Right. The question was, um, do they speak English when they're out of class? Do they speak Ma or Swahili amongst themselves? And the answer is pretty much yes. Yeah. Um, they. I mean, if we all gathered in France, you know, even those of us that know French would probably speak English to one another, and it's it's not uncommon. But in school and classes, they have to speak English, um, and it's it's enforced by the teacher. Um, so some, you know, I would say in the upper grades, it's enforced much more. Right. So we question. have one day at a time when you can speak. 
their own, own languages. Ah. The other six states of English. That's probably not true anymore. To, to whatever degree. Yeah, it may have evolved a little bit, but you know. The reason why our girls are very employable, a big reason is because they have a good use of English. Yes, ma'am. So how do the young men respond to these educated women? Right. What a good question. <laughs> I remember when I was I was in junior high and I there was an upper class woman coming out and I opened the door for her and she barked at me and she said, I can open my own door. And that just threw me because my father taught me shivery, right? So what am I supposed to do with that? Now you compound that to where rather than a girl in a bad mood barking at a little junior high boy, these girls are shaking their culture. And the boys often are left scratching their heads and what do we do with this? Um, you know, Jean and Mark have been in touch with uh, many of the you know, early graduates. And I'm getting to know a few of them as we go. Some of them have children now. Some of them are married. All of them have only, you know, the, their husband has only one wife. 100%. So if they are married, there's only one wife. So the boys are going to, they're going to struggle. It's going to be hard for them to, to, uh, to keep up. But usually the girls would find their men. It wouldn't be an arranged marriage from their father from a, a boy in the village because there's too much disconnect. They would probably marry someone from the university that, that they met at school. Yes, ma'am. So I understand, first of all, that the boys have their own schools that are paid for by the government, and also that the government requires all of the classes to be taught in English and all the exams are in English. Right. So it's not just like OBA says they have to speak English, but right. this is the government of Tanzania. It is, yes, all secondary. So, you know, these kids come in, there's 125 tribes, all with their own language. Then they come into grade school, primary school, and they're all taught in Kiswahili. Some of them may know it, most don't. Then when they come into secondary school, everything is taught in English. However, a number of years ago, the government made secondary school mandatory and and free. And so the many of the private schools emptied out. And now they have 100, 160 kids per teacher. <laughs> so how much education is going on there? The parents say, well, I'd rather have my kids go to the public school than the government school that pay tuition. But what kind of education are they getting? And so we, I see it all the time. I mean, even even uh, you know bigger kids are going to smash four to a desk like this. So yeah. I, Yes, officially they're learning English. Realistically, I don't know what they're learning. But there are educated boys that they can make Yes, them. absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah, your point is that... An you educated know, man is going to want an educated woman, probably. Right, yep. yeah. and vice versa. Yep, absolutely. Go ahead, questions. Go ahead, questions. Is that marriage mm -hmm. uh, arranged by the parents? It's all, yeah, nearly always. I mean, traditionally. So, the, you know, the empowered girls, the educated girls, they don't... They don't play those games. You know, no, thank you, Dad. I can find my own. But culturally, that male, even if they marry, they choose to marry each other, he's still obligated to pay the bride price. And so now the bride price might be different. So rather than just a Maasai boy out in the bush, now we have a professional. So he might have to pay more for that bride price. And so Dad would would benefit from that as well. So. Cows or? Yes, well, um, again, traditionally it would be cows, and as I understand, it's still three, four, or five cows, depending. Um, but in the city, the city Maasai, or even the city folks, because the bride price is not just a Maasai thing, that's pretty, well, that's pretty consistent throughout the continent, certainly sub Saharan Africa. Um, and so then the bride price for the city folks, they don't have access to cows, and so then it's usually a negotiated cash price for your wife. So, I know at our wedding, um, my father-in-law stood up and gave a nice little speech, welcome to the family thing, and he sat down and he stood up real quick, oh, by the way, her car insurance is due next week. <laughs> so, we have a little, you know, it's, there's cultural things throughout, so uh, he, he handed her off with me because now I have to pay her insurance. Uh, we pay the insurance. Um, we have just a, a few minutes, but I, I just want to say with hat in hand, and as most 
as sincere as I can communicate the appreciation of these girls, of the teachers, even of the parents, even though they may not understand in the beginning. I, I try to find the words to say thank you, but yet those words come so far short. What you're doing, you're transforming the lives of these people, and you're transforming the culture. You are changing the culture when you sponsor a girl. And for that, I say thank you. This most important part of my job is to communicate the sense of gratitude and the sense of, of transformation that you're providing. So thank you very, very much. Um, got to put a plug in for the uniforms. And of course, we still have girls that need to be sponsored for this year. So um, thank you very much. You're doing great work. I appreciate it. Yes? What's the cost of sponsorship and on the uniforms? Uh, the uniforms, uh, I think what, they're 60 bucks. I, I don't know. Yeah, and then uh, for tuition, it's a hundred bucks a month. So twelve hundred dollars will give the girl everything she needs, including school fees and, and room and board and clothes and toothbrush and feminine hygiene products and everything that she needs to succeed. And Jason, three individuals from this church have built buildings on the campus. Wow! Wow! The, the, the cooking sewing room, right? The laboratories and a test room. Oh, fantastic! Yeah, and that that. That makes that school a, a viable institution, right? I mean, it enables them to, to be able to educate in a way that, um, you, know, you know, you can't do it without the facilities, right? And the, this is one of the best schools I've been to in Tanzania. And so you can't do it without, we can't do it without the Thank you. The music starts. Right. Very perfect timing. Yeah. That's